Welcome back to Munchausen's Proxy, where we are happy to say that this week's Gotham Knights was not nearly as stupid as the last few weeks have been. Either that, or the CW's brainwashing has finally begun working. Either way, I did not want to jump headfirst into the television at any point in this episode just to stop the stupid. Having said that, Let's get into the spoiler review for episode 11 of CW's Gotham Knights. Last week, we left things with Turner getting cured of the bullshit radiation poisoning, despite Robin and Cullen not getting sick while coming into contact with the magic bullshit rock for much longer. In the process, Robin had to out herself to her mother at the hospital after getting Turner out without the police finding out he was there. We also got to see Harvey talk to himself, which should have been far more entertaining than it was, disappointing us mightily. Stephanie was put in danger because Brody is a dumbass, but not nearly as stupid as the imbecilic writers who come up with this trash, as he outed her to his Court of Owls mother. So Stephanie is now on the Court of Owls hit list. And they wrapped up with Turner and Duella jumping each other. Finally. This week, we open with a flashback of Duella's childhood in Arkham as she narrates. Little Duella is wandering around the halls of a lunatic asylum on her 8th birthday after getting a cupcake from the vending machine thanks to an orderly who did her mother a favor. She wanders to the Joker's cell where he slips her a Joker card while laughing insanely, but we never see him. When the flashback ends, she and Turner are half-naked after their tryst in the library at the end of last episode. She is not sure why she is telling him that stuff, and he guesses it is because it's her birthday, and she gets to spend it with people she actually likes, rather than Arkham orderlies and nutjobs. Then we get to see the police commissioner walking through a messed up police station being cleaned up after they evacuated due to a bomb threat. A box reeking of gunpowder was left with an Ace of Clubs card. One of the uniformed officers asks her about the card left with the bomb threat, assuming it was meant to mean the Royal Flush was behind it, despite them still being locked up. She tells him not to underestimate copycats. She then walks into an interrogation room where Stephanie is sitting and Harvey is waiting for her. Harvey asks Stephanie if she is sure she wants to do this and she says yes. That is when he brings the commissioner in on things, letting her know that Stephanie is willing to swear out an affidavit naming Lincoln March as the leader of the Court of Owls and responsible for the deaths of Bruce Swain, the mayor, Cressida, and more. Commissioner Soto is shocked. Cullen is doing shirtless push-ups in the tower when Turner comes in, not fully dressed, Harper smirking at him. Cullen looks at her and says that was weird. Then Duella comes in with a big naughty grin on her face, most of her clothes bundled up in her arms, and he says that was weirder. Harper gives him a look and they split up. Cullen goes to question Turner about Duella, and Harper goes to question Duella about Turner. Turner shuts Cullen down since it is none of his business. Duella, however, is reveling in it, saying, guess who took a ride on the Batwang? The siblings interrogate them, and while Turner is not talking, Duella is bragging with full details. The siblings get back together and look at each other, saying Robin's name simultaneously. Cullen calls Robin, but her mother answers, saying she is grounded and she wants to know who is calling. He hangs up and then he gets his hoodie on and leaves, to Harper's objection to being left with horny and hornier. Turner goes up to the top of the tower to see Duella. She needs help putting her bullet necklace on, telling him she swore to herself that if she ever saw her father that she would kill him with the bullet. Turner then mentions that Batman took care of that for her. She jokes that Batman killed three quarters of their parents. She wants to go party for her birthday, but Turner reminds her that a citywide manhunt doesn't hit pause just because it's her birthday. 
She entices him with the idea that Batman killing an innocent couple would have been big news on the street back in the day, and maybe her contact she wants to go see will know something about it. He wants to know who it is, and she dares him to come with him and find out. And this being the Gotham Knights, he of course takes her up on it. Harvey is leaving a message with Rebecca, promising not to let anything happen to her before hanging up, and asking Stephanie if Brody told her where they were going. She just knows that he was going somewhere safe and ditching his phone. He then gets a message on his phone, and he tells her he needs to take care of something work-related. He leaves, telling her not to talk to anyone without him, and he should be back in 20 minutes. We later find out that is retarded because there's no way what he was going to do would take 20 minutes. Stephanie's father, Arthur, is meeting with a doctor in his car who has been supplying him with pills for his wife. He jokingly bribes the doctor with coming to a quiz bowl recording as a contestant when he expresses reluctance to write him another script. The doc caves and writes the prescription and gives it to Arthur. Then the cops roll up and the doc apologizes. Dad's been ratted out. Stephanie is waiting for Harvey when Lincoln walks in. She screams for Commissioner Soto, but he smiles and says he believes she is on her lunch break. She snarks off, wondering if he has the commissioner on the court's payroll. He then drops the news that her father has been arrested, and she guesses he set it up. He denies it, of course, claiming to be a big fan of Quiz Bowl. He explains that Arthur's doctor shopping over the years means he is facing 20 to life. She calls him a monster and tries banging on the two-way mirror for help. Lincoln gives her the good news, however, that GCPD has kept the arrest off the news, meaning their perfect family image is still intact. He suggests Dad could be back hosting Quiz Bowl by the end of the day, with the charges dropped, the record expunged, and the public none the wiser. She tries to dodge around him, but he prevents it. She asks what he wants. But they cut to Robin, in her room, as Cullen comes up the fire escape. She scolds him that he shouldn't be there. Her mom will call the cops if she sees any of the idiots. He asks why, and she has to admit that she had to reveal her secret identity to her mother after taking Turner to her to get treatment. He asks her how coming out of the closet went, and Robin grumps that it didn't end in a hug. Being a vigilante wasn't what Mom had in mind when she suggested helping out around the neighborhood. Cullen apologizes. Then he drops the news that Duella and Turner bumped uglies. She laughs, wondering if he is joking. Cullen is worried about Turner, because it seems like he is giving up. Robin lets Cullen in on the secret that Batman was responsible for Turner's parents dying. And he found out when he was being held by the Court of Owls. And she had to confess she already knew. Cullen makes the connection and guesses it was her who stole the journal pages. That is when he gets a call from Harper telling him that the new couple bolted and took the police scanner with them. He realizes it means whatever they are doing will have them dodging the police. Robin tells him he and Harper need to find the two dumbasses before the cops do. Speaking of dumbasses, they are at the Ace of Clubs bar. Duella, dressed in glasses and a blonde wig, hands Turner one of the shots she stole from another table. She muses that it is crazy that they never would have met if they both hadn't been framed for murdering his father. Turner, wearing a beanie as a disguise he previously made a joke about nobody recognizing him in, toasts to the Court of Owls, as Duella does the same before they chug the shots. She then asks him if his disguise is more Bat Brat Spring Break, meaning temporary, or the new him. He's about to answer when a guy at the other end of the bar starts harassing a woman for rejecting him despite him buying her a drink. She yells at him and then stabs him in the hand. Turner smiles, thinking she is crazy. Duella smiles much more broadly and tells him she knows. She loves her before going over to hug her mom. Turner is stunned. 
After a commercial break, Mom is doting on Duella in a booth, asking Turner's opinion of Duella's looks. Duella tells her mother that every birthday this was her wish, and Mom hugs her again. Turner wants to know how Jane found them, worried that others might do the same. But Duella explains that it was she who found Mom. Apparently, they had agreed that if Mom ever got out of Arkham, she would send a signal out for Duella. The bomb threat at the GCPD with a playing guard telling her where to meet. They laugh about it. Then Duella asks how she got out. Mom deflects that by teasing her about not seeing her for months, and then when Duella shows up, it is with a boyfriend. They stutter before explaining they are sort of roommates, Gotham's most wanted fugitives together. Mom already knows, for killing Batman. And Duella explains it is a misunderstanding, while Turner jumps to her defense, saying Duella never killed anyone. And Mom is reading the body language of the two pretty easily. That is when Duella brings out the reason they wanted to meet with Turner there, Batman killing his parents back in the day. Mom dismissively asks, what does she care about a guy who looked better than her in tights? Duella suggests that maybe the part about Batman killing her own father, and Turner gulps down the rest of his beer, heading to get the next round so they can catch up. Stephanie, meanwhile, is visiting her father, demanding to know what he did. Arthur claims it was a setup so the GCPD could move past the embarrassment over the missing kids. And here I am assuming he meant the idiots. Stephanie is surprised they told him about the deal. The deal they never bothered to show the audience. And he says they told him gloatingly. Arthur is relieved, but Stephanie tells him she can't help him. She can't give up her friends because they will die. He argues that her mother will die if she doesn't. He can't take care of her from prison. She sadly tells him that he is not taking care of her. He is keeping her drugged. He fires back that he's keeping her alive, keeping her from pain, anger, depression. He then lays on the guilt trip, trying to get her to help her mother before it gets worse hinting that if he is not there to take care of her, then Stephanie will bear the brunt of her mother's violence. Back at the bar, Mom asks how she could be broke, and Duella points out that it is kind of hard to pull jobs while trying to avoid a manhunt and clear their names. She asks if Mom is disappointed, but Mom smiles and tells her not to worry. She has been itching to get back in the game, make some money, and get them out of Gotham. Duella hesitatingly asks what she would think if she invited Turner. Mom scoffs, disappointed that she has not listened to a word she has told her about men. Duella points out that he isn't even 18 yet. Mom says if Turner makes Duella happy, it makes her happy. Then she says the next round is on her, lifting the police scanner and heading to the bar. At the bar, she recognizes the bartender. The bartender is a former con partner. Mom asks her if she wants in on 5% of a $10 million reward. Cullen comes out of the elevator at GCPD in uniform again, with a cup of coffee for the desk sergeant. The sergeant calls out to the other rookies in the room and tells them that if they have to be a rookie, be like Hines, Cullen's cop identity. Cullen then asks to borrow their police scanner because his precinct scanner is busted. As he's walking away, the sergeant invites Cullen to join him and some other cops to watch a game that night. Cullen begs off due to other plans and the sergeant gives him a rain check. As he is about to leave, he sees Stephanie being led through the station and she sees him. He asks the desk sergeant about it and he informs Cullen that the quiz bowl host got pinched and the commissioner is keeping a lid on it until his kid cuts a deal. She knows where the idiots are. Back at the bar, the bartender is giving Turner a beer with a tense look, and Duella joins him. She apologizes for springing Mom on him. He argues about Mom stabbing a guy through the hand, but she defends her. He is positive she wasn't released on good behavior, but Duella doesn't care how she got out. She got her mom back, which is something she dreamed of for years. 
Turner suggests Mom could be scamming them right now. And Duella cuts him off, challenging him to tell her that he hasn't dreamed of getting his parents back every day since they died. He concedes the point. Duella asks him if he would go with her and her mother, if her mother could get them out of Gotham that night. He asks about everyone else, and she says who cares about everyone else? This shocks him. His brain kind of freezes, and she tells him to forget it. He would just slow them down. And this is when he starts to look woozy. Duella takes off, and he is just standing there like an idiot when Harvey shows up, growling at him for being there and hauling him away to get him home. In the hall, Harvey stops and starts lecturing Turner. Turner turns on him, demanding to know if he helped Batman cover up killing his parents. Harvey reminds him that Batman had a code. He doesn't kill. And I was glad someone on this show remembered that. Turner fires back with the fact that Batman killed the Joker. Turner passes out halfway through Harvey's attempted defense. As Harvey is trying to shake him awake, Duella's mom injects him with something that knocks him out. A big grin spreads across her face, which is not good for Harvey. Down in an abandoned subway, Duella comes on Mom putting Harvey in a straitjacket. Mom gives him to her for her birthday, explaining that it was Harvey who had Mom locked up in Arkham. Duella is surprised to hear it was Harvey who had Mom locked up. But we cut to Harper, walking into the Brown Mansion to find Mom raging at Stephanie for not getting her father off by giving up the idiots. The place is a mess, and Mom is going on about giving Stephanie the perfect life. Stephanie snaps. She yells back that her life is not perfect. Her whole life is a lie, created by her parents to put on a twisted show in order to keep up appearances. She is done hiding, and being manipulated by them both. She then asks Mom if she ever really loved her, or was she just an overpriced investment? And that is when Mom slaps her. Which is when Harper jumps out and warns Mom not to touch Stephanie. Stephanie wants to know what she is doing there. Harper ignores her and goes off on Mom, accusing her of being a typical abusive parent. She points out that Mom projects everything she hates about herself onto Stephanie, and Stephanie doesn't deserve it. She doesn't deserve Stephanie. When Mom storms out, Harper turns to apologize that she ever thought that Stephanie would sell them out. They are about to swap spit when Cullen calls to tell them that units are rolling on the Ace of Clubs. Jane Doe slaps Harvey awake and he immediately recognizes her and is surprised. Mom is kind of hot for him, weirding the hell out of Duella. Harvey tries to tell Duella to go get Turner because he is passed out at the bar. But Mom tells him that the only thing he cares about is himself. He didn't go there to save Turner. He got a message from a concerned voter about a crazy bitch named Jane Doe being there. The message that took him away from Stephanie at GCPD. Harvey suggests Arkham doesn't take well to escapees, but that is when Mom drops the bomb that she was released thanks to his political opponent, Lincoln March. He asks if she told Lincoln that she was his lunatic stalker, surprising Duella. Jane denies it, saying she fell for him. Mom claims they had a love affair, but then he ghosted her, that Harvey came to her for boinking and then cut her off. Duella is enraged. Jane calls him two-faced and that Lincoln can now run on the slogan that Harvey Dent is the most dangerous man in Gotham. She then tells Duella that Harvey is her father, shocking them both right into a commercial. When we come back, Duella is examining Harvey's face, saying she is not seeing it. That is when Jane reveals that the only way she would bring her into the world while stuck in Arkham was to make sure she wouldn't need to protect her by telling everyone that her father was Gotham's most prolific murderer. The Joker laughed when she asked permission to do it. He liked the idea, liked Duella, but ignored her once he saw she could take care of herself. Duella then goes over to Harvey to demand to know if it is true. Harvey is at a loss. 
thinking to himself that it sounds like something his altar could do. He has no idea if it's true or not. It is certainly not an impossibility. Duella goes off on him. He tells her that he didn't know about her. Jane takes the bullet necklace off Duella's neck and puts the bullet in a gun, telling Duella that it is an opportunity presenting itself. She then gives the gun to Duella. But we cut back to the Ace of Clubs, which has morphed into a nightclub somehow. The police are sifting through the crowd looking for Turner, while Stephanie and Harper try to find him even as they are trying to evade getting caught themselves. Harper takes the excuse to dance with Stephanie, and this is where we get the Easter egg of Harper Rowe's comic book name, Bluebird, dropping from Stephanie as she strokes Harper's blue feather earrings. Harper keeps her eyes on her to keep her from watching the cops as she was and Turner is completely forgotten about at this time. In the back, one of the cops finds Turner in a storeroom, passed out. He calls it in as a possible overdose. The girls hear it and head to help him, stopping to let Stephanie hack into the bar's cameras with a device Harper has on her. They can see the police cars outside on the stolen video feed. Harper goes out to disable the cars while Stephanie heads for one of the officers to lead him astray. When she gets him into the hall, Harper zaps him with a stun gun from behind. They then go back into the club in time to see the cop leading Turner away in handcuffs. He is still under the influence of the drug and alcohol, so he's unsteady on his feet. The cop leads him through the alley to their car, but the battery is dead. Another car pulls up and they put Turner in the back and it peels away. Turner comes around in the back of the cop car. He tries to talk to the cop driving the car telling him that if he takes him in, he's a dead man. And it turns out to be Cullen, griping that he is lucky it is him and not some court executioner. Duella is about to shoot Harvey when he gets her to stop, begging her to hear him out. She gives him 30 seconds. He tells her about being two different people very clumsily and not having control of it back in the day. She doesn't believe him. He tells her that she doesn't have to live up to being the Joker's daughter anymore. Jane eggs her on as a train screams close by and Duella shoots him. Jane smiles broadly. Back in the tower, Cullen is pissed at Turner for leaving. Turner retorts that he didn't ask to be saved. Cullen yells back that he doesn't have to ask. That is the point. That despite him banging Duella, and making bad choices, he isn't abandoning Turner. And when it gets him killed, maybe then Turner will understand how much Cullen means to him. Turner pauses to soak that in, and then hugs Cullen, despite Cullen trying to push him away at first. Upstairs, Harper brings Stephanie some bedding for the night, offering her the couch. She then tells her about Duella running off with her mother, who just got out of Arkham. Stephanie explains that it took being asked to give up her friends to realize she was never really her parents' daughter. She doesn't know who she is, or even what she likes or wants. Harper disagrees that she does know, in her gut. For once, don't think before answering, what does Stephanie Brown want? Apparently, the answer is scissoring Harper in front of the big window of the tower while it rains. Jane and Duella are hiding out in a trailer as Mom pulls out some cups and booze. Duella is looking disconsolate while Jane rants about how bad Harvey was. Taking Duella's childhood, Jane's motherhood. Jane then tells her that Duella showed her that she turned out to be exactly how she raised her to be. However, Harvey wakes up in the hospital, as we all probably knew he would be. A GCPD officer tells him he was found in an abandoned subway. The owl coin he had in his pocket saved his life. He says he was lucky, but she tells him he will wish he wasn't as she turns to the TV where the newscast is announcing that Duella is Harvey's kid with Jane Doe, and he locked her up in Arkham to cover up his affair with her. And to round things out, we have Lincoln prodding his wound from Talon that hasn't given him nearly as much trouble over the last few episodes as it should have. 
Rebecca asks him how he feels. He replies that it feels fine, but it will take a little longer to get over his wife telling Talon to skewer him. She explains that she had to distance him from the court. That if she knew he would leave his trophies out for Brody to find, she would have had Talon aim higher. He walks out of the room and she checks her phone messages. Harvey wants her to call him, telling her that he knows about Lincoln and the court and he won't let anything happen to her. She keeps replaying the last part of his message with a smile on her face. The message he left while with Stephanie in the interrogation room early in the episode before leaving her to Lincoln. And that is how they end the episode. As I said near the beginning of this review, this episode did not suck as much. As I thought on it, I came to the conclusion that it is because there was not much going on that was supposed to be high tension and action. The last few episodes were full of such things, and it is my guess that the writers have no idea what they're doing when it comes to that sort of writing. Given the state of Batwoman throughout its run, I am probably not far off. This Gotham Knights episode seemed to be a breather episode to separate what had been going on before and what will go on in the penultimate and finale episodes to wrap up the storyline in the finale. CW has finally announced the cancellation of Gotham Knights, and the ratings bear out the wisdom of that decision, with only 360,000 watching episode 11, and a demo scraping the absolute bottom of the barrel at .04. This is the lowest demo I have ever seen for any show on a mainstream network. Whether the writers knew in time to write a finale that wraps everything up in a bow or not is questionable, since they were only canceled this week. While I said this episode wasn't as bad, that doesn't mean it was without the ever-present CW retardedness. And since that is what we are all here for, let's do this. We start in the very first scene because Gotham Knights doesn't believe in making you wait for the retarded. No, they want to bash you over the head with it right away. In this episode's case, it was trying to make the audience believe that an 8-year-old would be allowed to wander through the halls of an institute for the criminally insane by herself. Given what kind of criminals Gotham is notorious for having, This is even less believable. Then we're supposed to believe that someone who went to law school, passed the bar, and practiced law long enough to run and win election to be district attorney of Gotham would waste the time of the police commissioner by having her come down to take an affidavit from a high schooler that the candidate for mayor of Gotham is the leader of a secret criminal cabal responsible for all the high-profile murders in the city with zero proof. At no point was any form of proof brought forth in this episode. Now, my brain purges this crap from the memory banks almost as soon as I am sure it is worthless to recall, so I might have forgotten a single bit of proof that ties Lincoln March directly to the Court of Owls and either of those entities to the murders. However, I doubt it. I think this is another example of the lazy and idiotic writing by the Gotham Knights staff. They needed Stephanie at GCPD so that she would be in a convenient place for Lincoln to get to her while also having her father arrested and at the same station. There was no affidavit to be had. Not only that, swearing out such an affidavit would only open Stephanie and her family to libel and or slander lawsuits by Lincoln March. The shirtless Cullen push-ups were gratuitous and retarded. They didn't do this in any other episode taking place in the tower at this time of day. That we then get the double walk of shame shortly thereafter sort of mitigated it because the responses by the two parties to the walk were incongruous. Duellis was fine. That was Duella being Duella. I'm not sure why Turner got a bowling ball sized burr up his ass about it and tried denying what was plain. Turner not sharing would have been fine. Chivalrous even. 
Lying about it didn't work both for Turner's character or for the scene. That the siblings feel the need to immediately bring Robin in on the whole thing was baffling. Given she had to take Turner to the hospital to save his life and he did not wind up in prison obviously meant Robin's mom got involved. That they then did not hear from Robin immediately after is an obvious sign that mom is not a happy camper and Robin is probably grounded. There was no need to bring Robin in and, moreover, an obvious reason not to bring her in, especially since it would mean exposing one of them to the manhunt just to go chat with Robin about two of their fellow idiots making the beast with two backs. But wait, the retarded fest is not over because we then have Duella luring Turner out of the tower to go to a bar and taking the idiot's police scanner with her. The good thing is they took the scanner with them. The stupider thing happens later at the bar. The idea that the street had rumors of Batman killing Turner's parents, but nobody else in Gotham ever hearing a hint of such a thing, is ridiculous. The writers seem to think society has firmly erected barriers between the various classes, beyond which no or little communication can travel. Or when it does, it is more in the nature of myth and legend. Batman kills two innocent people and all of the criminals will know about it, which includes the upper-class criminals, who hang out with upper-class non-criminals, who would then talk about it with their non-criminal friends. Upper-class people also know middle-class people, who would be included in on the gossip, and they would spread it. From there, I think you get the idea without me sketching the rest of the way in which information flows throughout society. Needless to say, such a rumor would not remain quiet for long, unless Batman covered up the deaths to the point of nobody but himself and maybe Alfred knowing. So going to see a source at a bar to ask about it is imbecilic. But again, we need the story to happen. So Turner and Duella both need to go out. Harvey may be the character that irritates me the most. I'm not sure. Maybe it is him by sheer dint of the amount of screen time he gets compared to Rebecca March. I think she would be my second choice. Harvey, as I have said before, is a squinting, bumbling moron. That he is panting after Rebecca just makes that a match that should be sterilized before they accidentally procreate. It is completely believable that Brody is her kid. I am beginning to wonder if Harvey is actually his father. After Harvey leaves his message with Rebecca, he leaves Stephanie to the writer's devices. Very stupid devices. We later learn he is also being lured to the Ace of Clubs bar that Duella is heading to with Turner. The second the scene with Arthur Brown and the doctor popped up on screen, I had a feeling the doc was off. And damn if I wasn't right when the cops show up to nail his ass for doctor shopping on behalf of his wife. The entire meeting between Lincoln and Stephanie was botched. I blame Anna Lore and the writers. Lincoln was fine in the scene. Menacing and mysterious, it just worked. Unfortunately, he was playing off of Anna Lore's Stephanie, and she couldn't seem to figure out what she was trying to project. A brave fear or a useless bravado. And so she seemed to be trying both at the same time. And of course the idiots writing this crap cut the audience out of the most important part of that conversation. Namely, the actual f***ing deal attempting to be brokered by Lincoln. Because they cut to Robin, getting a visitor in Cullen. I still don't know why this scene was needed, except to have Navia Robinson in the episode. Almost like they have a screen time quota of some sort to meet. Why Robin needed to give Cullen orders to go find the two jailbroke idiots and get them back undercover is beyond me. Oh wait, I know. It is so Robin could tell Cullen something she could have sent in an email. But then that brings us back to the screen time quota idea. When Duella and Turner get to the Ace of Clubs, it looks like a bloody tea room, not a bar. 
Never mind the nightclub it transforms into later in the episode. Turner's disguise is just one step below on the stupid scale from Clark Kent and his glasses. At least glasses break up the line of the face a little. All Turner was wearing as a disguise was a beanie. And Jane Doe, Dwell's mom, casually stabbing a guy in the hand, but still sticking around the bar without consequences, doesn't pass the believability test, despite the fact that he was harassing her. Pretty sure the actress playing Jane Doe is either terrible or she has execrable writing for her. And on Gotham Nights, I always lean towards the writing. Especially since Lindy Booth is a decent actress that I have seen on other things. The entire second half of the initial scene in the bar after the commercial was pretty stupid. Everything from the raging misandry from Mom to just so happening to meet someone willing to help drug a stranger in the bartender. Jane not knowing anything about Batman killing Turner's parents is either what I have been saying for a few episodes now. Namely, he didn't do it, but still felt responsible for not preventing it. Or, Jane is so narcissistic that nobody outside of herself and Duella matter. And Duella only matters so long as she fits into Mom's vision of Duella, rather than being actual Duella. As much as I dislike the scene between Stephanie and Lincoln March, her scene with her father was on the other end of the spectrum. While not nearly as good as her confronting her mother's addiction a few episodes back, it was still good. Her standing up to her father's enablement of her mother's pill-popping and drunkenness was a progression of sorts for the character. Of course, I'm not sure how that would work out logistically. I mean, GCPD and the Court of Owls both now know Stephanie Brown knows where the idiots lair up. How did she manage not to get locked up as an accessory after the fact? Or detained on a material witness warrant? In reality, she would not have been able to walk out of that station on her own recognizance without one hell of a lawyer. Dad trying to guilt trip her and then threatening her with her mother's violence was a very good touch on the other side of that scene. It was the lone bright spot in this episode. And I say that in comparison to the rest of the episode only. It was not on par with the Robin Duella Eunice scene and not as good as the Stephanie Mom's Addiction scene from episodes 7 and 8 respectively. Then the stupidness at the bar just explodes as Jane Doe swipes the idiot's police scanner right under the nose of her daughter, arranges the portrayal of Turner to the police with the bartender. There's a cut scene I will get to. But then Duella and Turner fight and go their separate ways, but by this time Turner's already descending into a drugged haze and Harvey shows up, summoned anonymously by Jane for her revenge on him. None of that was overly believable, especially when it was piled on top of each other. The police scanner is a life-saving necessity for people on the run from the police. They don't leave it out on the table and they don't turn it off. Not if we want to be serious. One or the other of the idiots should have been listening in on it via an earpiece. But then, Jane wouldn't have been able to swipe it so easily. The fight the two lovebirds had was moronic, and given Turner's state recently, Duella would have been more cognizant of him starting to display symptoms of being very much not alright out in public Having Harvey there was a contrivance set up in the scene where Harvey ditches Stephanie. It was low-grade dog shit for writing. The most amusing scene was Cullen making a new friend in the desk sergeant when he went to GCPD to borrow their police scanner. Getting an open invitation to join the off-duty cops to watch a game was funny. Not ha-ha, laugh-out-loud funny, but amusing. Which is something for this show. I was hoping for another really good scene when Stephanie and her mom were going toe-to-toe back at the Brown Mansion. Alas, it was derailed by super lesbian, Harper. 
Her inclusion in the scene actually spoiled it. Fallon Smith is not a good actress, and she has even worse writing to lean on. After Mom slapped Stephanie, that was not where we needed to have Harper white knighting for Stephanie. No, that is where Stephanie should finally have stood up for herself against her mother's abuse and addiction and stop cowering before it. We, the victims of Gotham Knights, deserved at least that bit of character progression from her to go along with standing up to her father. It would have completed the episode's transition for Stephanie, from abuse and neglect victim to someone who can stand on her own in the face of it. Instead, we get the prelude to scissoring between Stephanie and Harper, which has been coming since they worked together to defuse the bomb at the Founders Gala way back in episode 3. The only reason they didn't get it on right then and there was Cullen's vag blocking with his call about GCPD rolling on Ace of Clubs. Then we get the scene with the two crazy chicks and the squinting wonder. I already knew what was going to happen. I knew Duella was going to be enticed to avenge herself on Harvey for locking Mom up. And Harvey would survive. I was a little surprised that they brought the comic origin of Duella into this, her being Harvey's kid and all, or I should say one of her comic origins, since there's not one definitive origin for Duella. Everything else was predictable, including Harvey's altar hauling his ashes with a crazy chick like Jane Doe. Apparently, his altar has never heard of contraceptives. The rescue of Turner at Ace of Clubs that has suddenly become a hopping nightclub was comical. The writers really need to either watch more porn or take cold showers before writing scenes like this. It was infantile and imbecilic. In the middle of a club, crawling with cops, Harper is making calf eyes at Stephanie and putting the moves on her. Really? As believable as Turner, Gotham's most wanted, being able to walk around in broad daylight in a beanie and nobody recognizing him. And what the hell did the bartender slip Turner that he is still knocked the hell out so many hours later? Hell, Harvey woke up sooner and Jane injected him directly with the drug she used. GCPD is as useless in Gotham Knights as it was in Batwoman. The fact that two girls managed to orchestrate the escape of one of Gotham's most sought-after criminals with the ease they did is severely far-fetched. And only a handful of cops showing up at the nightclub to look for Turner is also less than likely. If for no other reason than the Court of Owls minions within the command structure of GCPD would make sure multiple units would be scrambling for a tip like that not just the two that showed up with a handful of officers that searched the crowd. And they would not have just thrown Turner into the back of a car without making sure who it was they were giving him to and likely having somebody else jump in the car with him. When they finally get Turner home, Cullen ripping into Turner was good. And it went idiotic by turning into an emotional hug fest. I was face palming that crap. Someone needed to rip into Turner for being a neurotic twit lately, despite what he has been through, because it was going to get them all killed if someone didn't. However, Turner's behavior changing like someone flicked a switch? No, I don't think so. That is not how that sort of thing works. I was unclear about the last scene with Stephanie and Harper. Let's ignore the lead up to the scissoring. That has been silly and more predictable than calling where in the sky the sun is going to come up. Now, what I'm talking about is whether or not she is a fugitive now too, or is she just homeless? I could believe either, but they were not exactly straight on that given that she was allowed to walk out of the police station and go home. She can't go home because mom is a hopped up lush with a vicious temper. That part I understand. What I don't understand is why she's staying with the idiots in the Tower of Solitude. 
Does she have no other friends or relatives with whom she could crash until all the legalities are straightened out? Or maybe she doesn't want to get them dragged into the court nonsense. And why hasn't she also dropped the dime on her mother? Mom should also be in jail, since any search of the Brown residence would turn up a multitude of illegal prescriptions in her name and the names of her daughter and husband. And that is another reason I am shocked Stephanie was even allowed to walk free in this episode. That whole family should be neck deep in DEA agents. Stephanie, as a minor, would largely be shielded from prosecution, especially if she cooperated. Mom and Dad, however, would be f***ed. Ever since the opioid epidemic and the crackdown on illegal opioids, illegal prescriptions, and doctor shopping, the feds have taken that extremely seriously. Duella hiding out with her mother and her demeanor in the trailer made me pretty sure what would happen there too, next episode and in the finale. Duella and her mother would get into trouble, and Duella is going to have to make a choice. Stick with mom or choose the idiots. The idiots will probably come to the rescue, and she will choose the retarded musketeers. Mom is likely headed back to Arkham, with or without Court of Owls sponsorship. The last two scenes were also puzzling. Harvey waking up and being shown his political career is over and he might be going to prison himself was odd enough. But then you have Rebecca March getting misty-eyed over the message he left for her earlier after she beat her husband down some more by suggesting she should have had Talon aim higher. It was strange, and I'm not sure what the writers are doing there. We have two episodes remaining, and I am relieved to find out we will be saved a second season of this slop. It is a poorly written, poorly acted, shoddily designed, and moronically plotted show that should have been good had they stuck with the premise and leaned hard on the source material. Instead, They made sure to slather modern day all over this show from start to finish. As a matter of fact, that seems to be the only thing writers do know how to do at CW. Write indoctrination material into what should be entertainment. For those of you worried about the showrunners and writers' future prospects, worry not. In today's Hollywood, people fail upwards. After all, The showrunners wrote for Batwoman, and when that house fire finally collapsed under the weight of the gasoline they were dumping on it, CW promoted them and put them on ruining this show too. Well, congratulations. You did it. A one-and-done show that never should have been allowed past the pilot. Episode 12 won't air until June 20th, so I get a reprieve this week. One I am heartily grateful for. After 11 episodes, I am still standing firm on my assertion that the only good thing to come out of this show is Olivia Rose Keegan's Duella. I am also still of the opinion that the writers and showrunners had no idea what to do with her. Nobody else aside from Misha Collins' brief turn as Harvey's alter has had more than a glimmer of anything approaching a good scene, never mind a good performance. And this episode was no different the one scene with Stephanie and her father aside. That is all I have for this video. If you like what I do here, please subscribe to the channel and make sure the bell icon is clicked so you know when new videos are uploaded. Also, please hit the like button, share the video, and comment down below. It is all appreciated and it all helps. Next up will be the Marvel video I have been slogging to get together. Given it has dashed past all expectations for when I thought it would be done, I will not guess when it will be finished. Unless something interesting pops up in the news, that should be the next video. Until then, juice.